Welcome everyone, um, and it's great to see so many people here today. Um, thank you to IPA partners, supporters, um, uh, for everyone coming for this conversation with Nick Reed. So welcome to the South Australian Public Service, Nick, and we'll hear more about how that's going for you. Um, and thank you to those joining us virtually. So I'm proud to say that we probably have around, oh, I think around 350 people in the room and probably about 200 people or more virtually. So um, thank you so much. It's great to get together um, uh, in large crowds, which is, which is something we haven't actually had the opportunity to do over the last sort of 12 months or so. I think most of you know me. I'm Irma Ranieri, Commissioner for Public Sector Employment. Um, and I'm pleased uh, to have Nick here today, but I'm also very grateful to my colleagues, Senior Management Council members, um, to other executives across government, and of course, um, all of you that found time in your diary to actually come along to this very important event. I'm really looking forward to the conversation with Nick. I have lots of conversations with Nick, but this one's a bit more public. Um, I found him absolutely fantastic to work with, so uh, uh, thank you, Nick, for, for I guess the reciprocal um, relationship that, that's being developed. In particular, I want to find out more about what makes Nick tick and his focus for the future of South Australia, and there'll be a lot about that today. Nick will share his uh, current focus and agenda, um, together with some of the leadership lessons he's learnt throughout his 30 plus year career. I do want to acknowledge though firstly that this land that we meet on today is a, uh, the traditional land of the Kaurna people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Kaurna people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Kaurna people today. We do have Jack Buckskin to actually give us the more formal welcome to country, but Jack is running late. Um, he said he's four minutes away, so I'm going to continue with the introductions. If Jack's more than four minutes, uh, we will get uh, on with the interview, but we will certainly stop to ensure that we get that welcome from Jack. I'd like to thank the um, uh, IPA members for organising uh, today. Uh, as I said, Senior Management Council are here today, but they are very strong supporters of IPA, and I think half of us are on the Council of IPA, so it actually does give an indication of how important IPA is um, in getting us together. I know it can sometimes be difficult to step away from our desks, to take time out for ourselves and have these sorts of conversations, but I'm confident that this conversation will give you an insight into the mind of one of South Australia's um, greatest leaders, um, and certainly in his previous role, um, has been an inspiration for the state. Recently, we've had several exciting and challenging conversations, including with Professor Nicola Spurrier, um, and the Chief Executive of Env Environment Protection Authority, Tony Ticelli. And for those of you that attend the In Conversation um, event, you know that we have some interesting insights um, and often things that, that we generally wouldn't have in a more formal setting. Just some housekeeping today. Can you please place your mobile phones on silent? I hope mine is on silent. Rick, if it rings, you know what to do. Um, there are toilets in the building. Follow the signs just along there. If there is an emergency and we need to evacuate, follow the staff as they lead you outside. We would appreciate if you don't leave the conversation, if you need to leave, try and exit between activities. It's not a long time um, and it's good to kind of see the flow. Um, and there's some exciting things that, that uh, we'll show you today. We also encourage our in-person and online audience to participate on the Q&A via Slido. And we've already got questions that have been submitted, but please submit your questions by scanning the QR code. We're very good at this now, aren't we? Um, they're on your tables and on the screen with your smartphones or tablets, or by entering www.slido.com into your web browser and entering the code 970027, if only I had 007 in that. But anyway, we have it somewhere in the mix. So I'll keep moving and introduce Nick. Um, it is my honour to welcome the newly appointed Chief Executive of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Nick Reid. Thank you, Nick, for making the time for today, but more importantly, sharing your learnings and vision with us today. Nick has been in the role for DPC for a whole four months. Um, but it's a good time, I think, when uh, it's early days to have some reflections on what he sees. What his focus will be in terms of collaboration across government, the community and the private sector, growing the economy, 
innovation and making it easier for people to do business with government. And he has lots of experience in that area. We know Nick is certainly a proud and passionate South Australian who has had a wealth of knowledge and experience when it comes to South Australia's business community. Having served as CEO of Bank SA and State General Manager for South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Territory for Westpac for the last seven years. His career in financial services spans 30 years, during which Nick has held responsibility for small business banking nationally and built a strong track record in digital transformation and driving growth and innovation. You know where we might be heading in the public sector. Nick is also an alumnus of the University of South Australia and INSEAD in Paris. During this conversation, you'll have the opportunity to hear some key insights from Nick and pose any questions that you might have. So it doesn't look like Jack's here yet, is that right, <laughs> Renee? Okay, so um, I think that we can actually get Nick to come up on the stage and we can get started. Um, for many in the room, it is, uh, and many streaming today's session, um, this is probably the first opportunity um, we've had to talk to Nick. So please join me in welcoming Nick Reed. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's great to be here and great to uh, see so many in the room, plus um, a few hundred on the webcast. So mm. it's, uh, um, hope we can uh, make it a, an enjoyable session for you all. I'm sure we can. I think the first couple of questions, we just got to get into it and then I'm sure it's going <laughs> to be great. Um, uh, just so we don't interrupt it too much, as soon as Jack comes in, what I might do is just finish off on that question and then we'll get Jack to do the, do the welcome. Sure. So Nick, I did say that this is people's first opportunity to hear from you as the head of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, the lead and central agency of government. Um, but let's go back. Tell us a bit about your own leadership journey and where did that start? Um, yeah, look, it started uh, early and um, I sort of reflected on this a little bit over the last year or two and and because uh, uh, it's a question you sort of get quite often. And, it actually started for me at school um, and, um, you know, I was uh, at school here in Adelaide and I um, was a, a reasonable tennis player and such that I... State level, um, reasonable. I was um, <laughs> thrown into this uh, role um, as captain of tennis for, um, very early um, in my schooling, so in sort of year 10, year 11 and and that was sort of quite young back then in the day. Now, Leighton Hewitt's and the various young kids come along, that's sort of common. But back then it was like um, never been done before. And, oh. and what that meant was like literally next door here, I went to a, um, a PAC and the rival school was St. Peter's and we used to have a thing called Intercol when it was here at Memorial Drive and the, and the stadium was full uh, of people, uh, literally uh, completely full and, you know, um, Things like having to make a speech in front of that many people at 14 um, scared the sort of, you know, what out of me. But it was um, a great sort of formative sort of period to sort of learn to, to have to do that, to uh, motivate uh, a team, um, even people much older than me. And, you know, in school years, it's sort of like dog years, it's multiples um, in, in terms of year 10 for a kid mm. um, having to uh, motivate a year 12 kid that's also three foot taller than me uh, and uh, so that was where I think it sort of started and I learned you know how to um, present a bit more and and, and thrown into the, the deep end a little bit so mm. definitely there and then and then from then on I guess um, in, in my career I, I just pretty well always had leadership sort of roles and, and I've I really love it, you know. I really enjoy uh, the experience of getting to know people and, and what makes them tick and, and I've had some some big learnings along the way and some big aha moments and some feedback along the way where people, you know, you literally get the feedback and you're going, oh my God, what have I done wrong? But, and it's not necessarily bad, it's just a development uh, area that you just maybe have a blind spot. We've all been there, we've all gone through it. And, and so, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, that's a big journey. Obviously, um, I've had a lot of great roles over time and I've learned something different um, in all of them. We might touch on that later. Great. Um you, you did, you went, I've got some notes here, you went to uni, but you started doing accounting, that was obviously not your bag, is that right? No, I think I, <laughs> I, spent, I went to UniSA or um, it was the old Institute of Technology and that 
rebranded halfway through for those old enough in the room to remember. But uh, um, and uh, yeah, look, it wasn't my thing. Um, I spent more time playing darts and having a few beers in the bar. Um, but uh, unfortunately, and then, but it, it was important for me because I then got a job. Um, and I very, very quickly figured out that education was um, yep. absolutely critical uh, in um, a few ways. I mean, one was um, in order to progress, um, you really needed to have that, that education, but also the perception of, of you. And it, it sort of relates to another story a bit later in my life where I was at um, ANZ and uh, I, um, you know, I was going quite well and progressing really quickly through uh, the ranks and and I was, um, uh, ended up running uh, the credit cards business for ANZ and, you know, performance was really, really strong. And this is one of those moments where I got some feedback and, okay, and, and it was, um, it was what, a simple thing. It was saying, oh, look, we think you need a bit of a uh, work on your strategic development, you know, like, and I'm going, oh, really? Okay, I thought I was all right at that. But uh, anyway, um, they uh, sent me off to, to INSEAD in, in Paris, which is um, an amazing experience. Um, and lucky enough to get the opportunity. But, uh, you know, that was an interesting one. So there's education, particularly if you're in a technical sphere, it's very important for do what you do. But in a more generalist role that I've always had, it was actually about perception as, a, as much as mm -hmm. anything. So I, I shipped off to INSEAD for a bunch of time, come back, and suddenly, you know, I'm a guru at strategy, and I'm going, well, what, did I really do anything here? And, yeah. and, um, <laughs> and um, I'm going, well, I didn't actually feel like I... Um, yeah. I got a few uh, templates and tools and frameworks and things out of it, but what I got was confidence. Confidence, yeah. Um, and um, it, it was amazing because uh, INSEAD uh, course, this course I went on, was basically 100 CEOs from all around the world, a um, little bit uh, heavier waiting in, in Europe. But, um, and, and so you're thrown into this uh, deep exercise for a lot of time and morning, noon and night, no breaks, no weekends off or anything. You're just basically in there full time for quite a while. And then, um, you know, the story that I tell is the very first day we had this group assignment type of thing to do and, and uh, it was one where um, I was there with the head of Italian Gas, the head of Belgian Post, or CEO of Italian Gas, CEO of Belgian Post, the CEO of a French um, insurance company and, and, and the list goes on and I was a bit intimidated I was going oh my god you know like I'm this sort of relatively young leader from Australia and and the thing that I got out of that and the, the, you know we were in our first little breakout room and we have to present the case study to the hundred people and I go well who wants to present and they all go not me uh -huh. yeah, not me I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to present and, and, um, and it was just a little interesting thing but over a month you sort of realize that Australian leaders and, and Australian heads of business can match it with anyone in the mm, world, right? It, it was a real eye-opener for me because mm. I always thought that, you know, people from the US or, or UK or, or France or were, were somehow better, better you know, yeah. um, but it was a confidence builder for me. So key there really is um, from as a public sector, education or furthering education is not just about those technical things, but it's about how, what it does to you as an individual yep. and the yep. confidence it builds. So let's take you on the journey of, um, of your life. Uh, you left the relative comfort of Adelaide, although we all love Adelaide now, don't we? Um, for Sydney in 1995, why did you do it? So you've, you've, did you do the INSEAD before that? No, no, that was, no, that was after. 2005. So, okay, yeah. so, so you pick up a family, obviously they would, would have been, is it, was it just you and your wife or you had children? No, I just, we literally got married. Um, at the, um, well, the funny story was I'd, arrived back from our honeymoon, literally got off the plane, went home, grabbed another bag and left to go back to, Sid uh, to the airport to go to Sydney, left my wife to sell her business and the house and stuff. Obviously she was happy to do all that. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean she was being um, <laughs> super supportive of me over the time, but we, I, I did it because I felt um, at the time, you know, we had a lot of um, centralisation of, of uh, activity happening um, out of Adelaide and, and I had just finished my degree, six years part time and I felt like I didn't have a lot of choice to be quite frank. Uh, if I wanted to progress I, I sort of had to give it a go. But equally I, I, I sort of had a, an aspiration, a, a, a sort of a, a comfort with taking a risk which I sort of still do today um, and um, I thought well you know 
let's give it a go. And, and Kerry was very supportive of it. Um, and off we went. And uh, so well, I went first and for a, a number of months and Kerry um, sorted out a few things. But, uh, but it was about, you know, um, you know, putting yourself out there a little bit and, and taking a risk. And, and that's something that I've learned along the way that it's, 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 it's can be a challenge. It can be a bit uncomfortable from time to time, but, but you generally get something out of it if you do it. So um, you obviously, when you do something like that, how do you adapt to change? Are you, you're okay with just, do you have family here, like your yep, folks yep. and the rest of it? So yep. um, you didn't mind actually leaving all that behind? Some of us are, you know, have emotional baggage. They'll kill us if we left them. <laughs> no, well, you know, sometimes it's can handy to be away from family too, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But it, it's really, um, you know, for me, you know, it's just about finding the right balance, you know, in, in life and how you do it. And, you know, it's easy to come back and talk to people and mm -hmm. much easier now with technology than it was back in the day. Sure. But, but um, it, it's, uh, you know, something that I, I just think that it, you just have to try to make sure you've got your, what, what do you really want to get out of sure. st life? And at that point, I was only 25, so I, was, we got, I got married quite young. Um, and I felt like I had, yep. uh, you know, some, yep. some goals to try and achieve and, and and I was really lucky to, to go to Sydney and within about, you know, six months, um, my boss who, who um, got me from Adelaide to Sydney at AMP at the time, and I worked here at AMP in Adelaide, um, he got um, headhunted to go and um, help set up Comsec uh, and he said, come with me. And, hmm. and um, that was just a crazy, crazy time to, um, uh, to sort of joined Comsec at a time when um, the, this thing called the internet uh, was um, <laughs> just starting in America and we were the first company in Australia to sort of see the trend and, and go, wow, that internet mm -hmm. thing and share trading could make a pretty cool proposition for customers and, and bottom line is, um, long, cut a long story short, it dominates uh, online share trading nowadays. But I, I was there and helped to to establish that um, that business and the marketing and the and just the whole proposition and it was a really great learning, a fun time and, and and digital as you touched on earlier has been a fundamental part of what I've done ever since. Great. So um, I'm just building on the story here. I, I Jack's here. Is that right? Oh, hello, Jack. We're going hey, to Jack. stop um, and get you to do. Our, is that okay if we stay on stage? Come through. Oh. Now, if, when, Jack, have you done something? Long story. You tell it. You didn't play for Port Adelaide, did you? No. Nobody plays for Port Adelaide. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Calm down, Jack. <laughs> oh. oh, we got four supporter. Okay. Um, sorry to jump right. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm listening to the conversations over here, which have been enjoying it. So, uh, Firstly, um, sorry for being a little bit late. I, I actually did my back a couple of days ago and I've been in hospital, so I'm like starting to walk finally, which is pretty cool because for a while there I was like, I'm never going to walk again. I'm a bit of a drama queen. I was telling myself that. I <laughs> probably couldn't stand up, but that's okay. Um, but I'm honored that I get the chance to come and do this really quickly. So look, you can think about where you're going with this next because I know what it's like to do these kind of things and you just want to drag out as much information as you can out of these kind of things. So uh, I might be able to give you some material, okay? Just, <laughs> you've got it all lined up anyway. You're all good. So you can't see the notes here. They're cheating. He's reading, he's reading his whole thing here. He doesn't remember any of his story. When he was 25 in Sydney, he was on another level. So uh, <laughs> just saying. So, reminders. Um, but uh, I do want to take the opportunity to acknowledge country mining. I look comforting. I look any yarding at tikan di to me and yachting yarding at tikan ding. I look neeper na. I do acknowledge our ancestors that gather in our lands and let our people know that we come as our spirits. Let us let them know that we come as friends of country. Um, ngan ari bin jenia cakap ganja pun doit pina kuno itu bakar ni ngai tangi will tak gan an orang gua orang gua meal. I do represent many Aboriginal groups. Three. I do represent four. I only mentioned three. Ghana is of the Adelaide Plains here, Narunga from the York Peninsula, Wurrungal from Streaky Bay, Sejuna. The other one why I don't mention them is because they're from Victoria. It's like talking about port. We don't do it. <laughs> um, so look, we, 
Um, but for, for myself, I've been a language teacher for around about 15 years. I enjoy um, language and culture. Talking about education is not something I wanted to do. I don't think anybody wants to get involved in education. I don't know. I think you just fall in place. Um, so I, I remember all of my mums and her sisters were all involved in education, kitchen table. All they did was talk about education. So I was like, when teachers like, what do you want to do when you leave school? I was like, anything but education. Um, <laughs> And here I am, 15 years into language teaching. So yeah, go education. Um, but uh, I am honoured that I get the opportunity to welcome you all here, introduce myself. For those that don't know me, my name is Jack. Everybody calls me Jack. Technically, my name is Vincent for the coppers, all right? My legal name. It's my they legal know. name. Uh, yeah, they know. Um, I, uh, Technically, I'm Vincent, but mum only ever called me Vincent when I got into trouble the whole two times, so uh, um, nobody ever calls me that. Um, she, it was really funny when she gave me this. Like, I found out in reception my name was Vincent. Um, I remember Miss Nitschke, she was like, oh, this kid's special, his name's Vincent, his name's Jack. We were, um, and I was like, where does this Vincent name come from? I've never heard it before. Uh, so I go home and ask mum, where's this Vincent name come from? She goes, you're named after my brother. I was like, well, his name's Erdy. Um, so she's like, well, Erdie's his nickname, Jack's your nickname, Vincent's his real name, your real name is Vincent. I'm like, thanks for telling me, I'm seven years old, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so my son's name is Vincent as well, just uh, <laughs> pass the buck, you know. Um, but I, I'm honoured that I get the chance to come here. My average name, Ganya Pundunduip, in a good which breaks up in three smaller names. Ganya, it's my individual totem. I'm speaking faster, like I'm trying to rush this, but then I'm just cracking on jokes. And I even, yeah, sorry, Athena, you know, like. <laughs> Give me a microphone, God. Um, but uh, it's, it's my individual totem. Good news, you tells you I'm third born in my family and we actually derive our names from our children. My youngest born is Bundundul the dragonfly. So we become Bundundul Itpinna, which means the father of the dragonfly. It was only fair because his name's Jackson. So Jackson, yeah, well anyway, I'm gonna play a little bit of didge for you as well. So uh, the, the didge is really cool because it's the only instrument I know how to play. And it's the best way to explain that us men can multitask when we want to, even at 25 years old, when we're in with all the big guns, we can, uh, we can actually uh, handle ourselves. So just, we just choose not to, ladies, that's the thing. So the didge is all about that. Um, doing multiple things as one, but before I do that, I want to pay respects to the Yongo people for allowing me to play this. I acknowledge them in their language for allowing me to use this instrument. Um, I'll play a little bit of that and then I'll let you get back to it. Thank you. Better, Jack. <laughs> All right, picking up. So Jack's reminded us that we were 25 years old. Um, it, did you have your children um, in Sydney? Was that where you, they were raised? You came back to South Australia? Because, yeah. No, no, I had them in Melbourne actually. So, oh. um, uh, so uh, yeah, I've got to that a same wife, I hope. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I was at um, Comsec uh, uh, in um, in Sydney and and. Uh, ANZ came knocking uh, for a role to help set up their uh, digital business at the time called ANZ.com. Uh, and it was 1999. Um, if for those, again, old enough to remember, that was the absolute peak of mm. the internet boom 
the first time around. Um, and Pets.com and all these crazy mm. companies were worth all this money that... But then, uh, anyway, so I went uh, with my wife. We moved uh, to Melbourne uh, in 1999 and, um, and, and I joined uh, NZ.com and it was a very crazy time. It was where it was almost freakishly sort of... Um, this whole internet thing was just going crazy mm. and a bit overheated, um, not only in you know, the US, but in, even in Australia, the, the rah-rah around it was, was probably a little bit uh, over the top. Uh, so much so, as people know, that there was a dot-com bust at the end of 2000, and I, I lost my job, um, as, really? as did everybody um, in um, ANZ.com. It was basically disbanded. Um, and, you know, it was because the hype was so strong that people thought the internet was going to, that's a fad, it's gone, see you later, it's all over Red Rover. And, I think we knew the underlying technology was, was fantastic and was going to continue, but for the people who um, weren't working very closely with it, thought it was basically all over. Mm. Anyway, so I, I went and got a real job um, and uh, in the credit cards area and, and went on from there. But yeah, we had our kids, um, both the Victorians, so uh, born in uh, 2000 and 2002. Great. Okay. So... So building up on that, given, given that sort of um, early career, quite a few experiences, just describe your personal leadership style. What, what does that kind of, what is, how would you describe it? Um, a few ways, and it's sort of changed a little bit over time, but, but um, look, I'm, I'm really um, trying to be as strategic as I can. I think um, really uh, setting the the agenda and the light on the hill for people to, to go after. Um, I like that. I like being very consultative and, and collaborative. Um, you know, I'm very decisive, but I like having input. I like having um, consensus in that sense, and not 100%, but enough to know that um, we're on the right track. Um, I like uh, to be courageous um, and um, uh, I, I very much like innovation and creativity, so tackling problems in a different way. And I've had a lot of great um, experiences over, over time in just tackling a problem and tackling it differently, uh, whether that be in a technology sense um, or a marketing sense. Um, you know, um, a, a small example would be when I was asked to promote credit card security at ANZ and I thought, oh my God, this is going to promote a real problem you know this is gonna we're gonna we're gonna sort of highlight a, a real challenge or a real risk for people with their credit cards and security and so kind of very long story short we, we decided to um, take the fraud software called Falcon that every bank has and then ANZ owned it by bringing this Falcon to life and then Falcon attacked the fraudsters and made a bit of fun of it but at the same time um, our business just went ballistic because we were we were sort of um, uh, you know tackling it, uh, an issue in a very different way right. and and we grew dramatically off the back of um, some very irreverent, funny type advertising, yeah. but are very serious topics. Um, and um, you know another example later in life was yep. the piping shrike. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, so you talked about innovation and creativity. Let's dig a bit deeper on the leadership qualities because I actually do think. You need leaders that would actually help you to be innovative and creative, and you're in the public service now. Um, risk and, um, I guess, the things that overlay means that sometimes that that's, that's either people see it as not being possible or maybe not in an environment where it allows them. So let's dig deeper on courage. You mm -hmm. talked about being courageous um, and a, a key quality. Um, so tell me about that for you and, and what does it look like when you're a courageous leader? Um, it just means you ha sometimes you have to do what's going to be unpopular. Um, and, um, you know, an example of that uh, was when I joined Bank SA and, and um, the, um, you know, it was my sort of childhood dream to, to, um, to do that sort of job. Um, never thought it would be possible for me to get that opportunity even. And, and here I am, I've rocked up um, after being sold the story and the investment story and, you know, we're going to... Um, and the context is uh, it was a 20-year market share decline in, in Bank SA. So for 20 years, it roughly lost a percent market share every year. Um, 
And for me, that was sort of exciting as an opportunity to come into. But, and I was, to be frank, I was promised investment, you know, dollars, um, all sorts of things to get it going. Going, like, this is going to be great. You know, I'm going to have all this money and we're going to do all this stuff. And, and I get, get there and it just d didn't come to fruition, right? So I'm going, uh, you know, what, where's, the, where's the money? You know, where's the, and it's like, well, you know, South Australia's got a few challenges and this thing and that thing and relative to investing elsewhere because Bank of Save was part of the Westpac group. It was like, well, we're seeing more growth in New South Wales and Victoria, and, and you can sort of see the story, right? So I'm going, oh, God, I've been let up the garden path here a little bit. What we did have um, is 50% um, more bank branches than any other bank. And whilst um, it is the worst thing in the world to have to close a, a bank branch, I absolutely hated it, it was my only way to, to self-fund um, the, the growth uh, strategy that I wanted to put into place. So it, over the next period of time, uh, I closed a bunch of branches, which was uh, very tough um, for people, for the brand. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, um, the, at, the, at the same time, we were investing in all the branches we wanted to keep. We rebranded Bank SA, we did the piping strike, we sponsored more events, we, mm. we did new uniforms, we upgraded technology all out of the savings of those branches and the thing just took off. Took right? off. And so yep. what was my fear and my, and my real, I was, you know, packing it essentially that, that this is going to be a, a real disaster turned into the, the key to unlock um, the growth. Um, and yeah, so that was, mm. that was cool in the end. Um, but at the time I was, you know, really worried and, and it took, um, you know, because it was like, you know, you, as you would know and if you were, you know, off a bit if you're a customer and, and your branch closed, you know, it's, it's not good, right? You don't like it, you complain and, you know, the list of complaints was, was long, but, but we actually reinvented the business at the same time. So we tried to give back and, you know, we did some cool stuff with um, digital, we're the first in the world to launch uh, fingerprint login on a, on a mobile phone, yep. that type of thing. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was, it was a balancing act, but yep. it really took, um, took courage and, um, Another example was with, with my mate David at down here was, was the I'm bank glad tax. You um, so, you know, I had to I had to come out against that because, you know, being the sort of leading um, leading uh, sort of banker in town, mm. so to speak, it, it was sort of everyone was pointing at me. Uh, but um, anyway, so I had to be the, the poster child against that, which was wasn't my um, most enjoyable period uh, because I was copying a, a bit of flack from various people. Um, the one, thing, the one thing I picked up when you were, it, it wouldn't have been comfortable, so I think that that's a really good example about courage. Did you absolutely believe in what you were doing? Because it felt like you, oh, you really yeah. believed in it, which actually meant you were prepared to fight for it. Totally. I mean, okay. you, 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 you can't fake it till you make it in those situations. You have to believe it. Yep. Uh, I, I believed in it. Uh, and another one, it, it weirdly, um, again, didn't think of it at, at the time. I was um, thrust, thrust into a press conference with people like Mike Smithson, you know, having a, having a real go. Um, and um, um, we, we put the stance out there against it and then suddenly over time the business banking customer base started growing and everyone loved the fact that we were fighting for, largely for the business. Um, consumers were sort of 50-50 and didn't really, you know, either here nor there, but the business community yep. weren't, weren't... And we are a small business community yeah, here, so that's right. oh, well done. Um, so let's move on to some advice. Give us some career advice, um, Nick. So if, what's your advice for those who want to continue to grow and develop? And I think that's all of us in the room. So, um, you know, what, uh, what would be the little gems, I think, that you would give in your own personal experience? Just some, some things that have really held good stead for you. Um, look, I think one that I believe in based on my own experience is... is never to sort of chase the next thing, uh, to really um, put your head down and get really focused on your role that you're doing right now. Um, you know, for me, I, I've actually never really applied for a job. Uh, every job sort of come to me and, and it's, it's been from just getting really focused and, and determined to, to be successful as I can be in my current role. And, and you do have to know where you want to go, and, and, but, but don't just chase the next thing. I've seen a lot of people over time, and particularly in the corporate sector, who are sort of, they, they get the next thing and then 
they're in there for five minutes and they're, where's the next one? And, and it's like, it's really um, a red flag to me that they're not going not to settle yep. And, and, yep. and get uh, really proficient in their current role. <clears throat> Another one would be um, what I call the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And I've been on the, be on the sort of receiving end of, of this and also um, help people. So um, mentorship is, is great and, and um, I, I sort of will try and describe what I perceive to be the difference. Um, a mentor will be someone you might talk to, you might have a coffee with and you get some advice uh, and you throw out some challenges and some, and some questions and you get some feedback and, and, and that's really valuable, right? Um, but in a, in a career sense, um, what I've seen work even better is a sponsor. And a sponsor is someone who will go out of their way to make something happen for you, uh, really advance your um, ad agenda or your career or whatever it might be. Um, and, and I think that's uh, something that all of you, um, you know, if you had that opportunity to have someone who will do that for you, um, you know, that's, that's amazing. And I had that for me. I had someone who, who, who basically helped me um, progress and, and if I delivered then the next opportunity would come and the next one would come because, um, you know, uh, that, that they thought, um, you know, both it was good for me and frankly good for them. Um, and, um, and I've been that for some people too. It's a great story um, in, um, in ANZ, I was running sm small business banking or the business banking space and it was a male dominated um, uh, part of the bank, and historically it always been that way, and I, I was sort of determined to, to break that nexus. Um, and um, so, you know, obviously um, in, in a big bank you have sort of uh, lots of people wanting to move around and stuff, and, and I essentially um, uh, took someone under, under my wing around working with them. There was, a, there, was a, there was a lady who wanted to be in business banking, and I said, well, look, we've, obviously we've got to go through a a merit-based process, but you know, I'll do everything I can to make sure that, that you get uh, opportunities. And it took 18 months, um, but that was uh, the, the, the catalyst and to get the first female in, and then suddenly others wanted to, to come and join. And we ended up having half the leadership team uh, in serious um, roles. This is head of New South Wales for ANZ um, business and head of Victoria, two of the biggest states were, were run by women, and then the whole central team was run by a, a female great. as well, and it was great uh, to do that. So it was, it's those sort of things, and the sponsor helps make it happen. Sure. The mentor gives advice, in my mind, and I think um, it's great when you can when you can play a role great. and have some impact like that. Excellent. There's 350 of us that want you to sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Nick, now we're going to get, I guess, to the because there's a bit of a difference, I think, in corporate and public sector. We tend to think so here. Um, you've spent uh, four months in the sector. Um, do you think there's a difference between what makes a good public sector leader um, versus a good private sector leader? Bearing in mind, I think we have different sort of focuses on the business, but what's your take now that you've been in both? Um, I don't think so, um, to be honest. Um, look, it's a very different organisation, but from a leadership perspective, uh, I'm tackling it the same way I would do anything. Um, and, um, you know, for me, it, it's very much about engaging people on, a, on, a, on an agenda, a journey, a strategy, if you like. And, and um, you know, I, I was, I've been thrilled, actually, with the engagement from the chief executives uh, across the agencies around um, the agenda that, that I, I sort of put on the table very early. But it was about, this is what I think, what do you think? Um, and and um, I've been really pleased with, with, with the level of engagement and, and collaboration on it. Um, and that's no different whether it's in the corporate sector or, 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 the, or the public sector. You know, we need a strategy, we need a vision, um, and we need to engage people. You know, for me, my role's, you know, um, it's got the DPC element, but it's also, you know, the head of the public sector. And so I I'm seriously want to engage um, 106,000 people, not just the whatever it is in DPC, the 500, but I need um, to do that in collaboration with the chief executives. So I'm very respectful of their roles. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm looking at Chris and, and, and Rick down here. I mean, you know, not to pick on them, but health would be the biggest business in South Australia if it was a standalone business, right? And Rick's would be right up there with it. You know, these are big, big, 
businesses, if you will, like um, big agencies, massive, massive impact. Um, and I don't know the first thing about either of them. So it, it's, I'm not here to say um, to Rick or to Chris um, how to run their business, but I am here to help and I'm here to, to rally the troops around an agenda that I think will put South Australian government in a much stronger position, put our economy in a much better position, put our community and our stakeholders in a much better position. And I find that quite engaging um, and, and exciting and, and I can't do it alone. Um, and that's why it's so important to, to engage with the leadership group and then with their permission, uh, engage everybody mm. and see if we can make a bit of stuff happen. Mm. Well, we've certainly talked about that um, uh, as we've been on the journey in the four months that you've been here. Um, I'm sure you agree, Nick, that the culture of an organ. I want to talk a bit more about culture. Now, you've, t you've talked about you know, our businesses, but what's, what's probably really key with our Senior Management Council is that we kind of work together. Um, we know each one has got issues, but we work together mm -hmm. uh, as a collective for the good of the whole. Um, uh, the culture of an organisation is key to employee satisfaction. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And ultimately, it's success. That's, I think, where we get innovation and creativity. Um, I think culture eats strategy for breakfast. What type of culture would you like to create or, or what, what type of culture on the journey to create? Um, look, the... Um, I've thought a lot about this. I mean, at the end of the day, if I had to summarise it in one... Thing, it's around the customer experience that I think we can create for our customers and a lot of times customers means different things to different people. We've got um, Paul down here whose customers are BHP, um, you know, um, or, you know, some of David's customers could be external people or, or internal people like some of our agencies. It's different to different agencies. So. I say customer in a very broad sense, but I think being really customer centric, I, I really think um, we can make a really big difference. Now, we're actually doing pretty well already uh, in the sense that in the multi-jurisdictional research that, that I'm seeing um, across the country, we're ranked sort of second, but there's daylight between us and first, which is New South Wales, and they've already gone down a multi-year program around being more customer centric. Um, they are drinking the customer Kool-Aid big time. Um, mm. And uh, um, that's really impressive. I spent some time with them a week, couple of weeks ago. Um, I was amazed at how ingrained it is uh, in everybody and everything. Every cabinet paper has a, you know, we do a, we do a cabinet office comment and a treasury comment. They do a customer comment on mm. every paper that goes to cabinet. Um, that shocked me, uh, but it, it's good. Uh, but it's, um, I didn't realise that. But mm. it was, um, that's how far they've gone. And they've obviously got a department and a minister and, mm. uh, and, and uh, leading it. Uh, someone's yep. leading that whole journey. But it's very much um, ingrained in them. And they've, um, their whole uh, service proposition, even through their physical stores, you know, that they, you know they've put a whole yep. lot more out there yep. and they can, you can do anything in, in a mm. store. So I really think that's, that's one. And innovation, if I had a second one, it would be innovation, innovation and how do we um, challenge ourselves. Um, you know, like Chris uh, McGowan talks about sort of whatever we do, let's be world-leaning in it, right? Innovate. Let's make sure that we're right out there. We are doing some pretty cool stuff. I very much believe in what Chris is saying as well. Um, and, you know, it's hard sometimes, though, because you get sort of day in, day out, you can sometimes get it caught in the grind. And I think what you know, I would like to do, and hopefully with the leadership team as well, we try and create that space where we can um, have a bit more time okay. to think about innovation. And, and some of the, the governance forums we're bringing in place um, will, will be where the leadership group or smaller mm. um, subsets mm. of the leadership mm. group will be getting together to talk about some of those things. And you'll talk a bit about those, we'll, we'll present that. Um, so, an important part of a thriving state is business, and you've talked a lot about that. Small business represents 98% of all businesses in South Australia. You know that more than anyone else. Um, how do you plan to help build bigger businesses or help those small ones thrive, especially on the back of what we've now seen with COVID, although I think we're very lucky in South Australia. So, just some things about yeah, look, I, business. Actually, we've, you know, we've done some pretty good stuff of late, um, you know, around making um, the, the, the cost of doing business um, uh, a bit better, um, and there's some great um, COVID relief as well. So there's some good things in there. The, the big sort of idea, if I have one, um, and, 
I, I sort of do, but I don't know how to make it come to life yet, uh, to be frank, um, and the, is I feel like um, we, we do a lot of good things to support small business, but it's a bit um, fragmented uh, across government. And I, I sort of feel like we need to bring it together uh, and then communicate a, a single-minded proposition to, to the small business sector, the small business economy, if you like, that, you know, here's how we can help you from whether you're a startup and things are going quite well in that space with Lot 14 and a bunch of things, but all the way, though, through to uh, succession planning at the end of the life of, of a business owner uh, who is looking to transfer the ownership to um, potentially their, their children or or potentially to a new owner. And, and it's a bit more acute for us in South Australia because we've got an ageing population and we've got the highest penetration of small business. So you put those two things together, we've got a, a real succession planning challenge. And there's all this stuff in between. And, and, and Adam's um, team, I can see Adam over there, does a lot of really good stuff here. And there's a lot of good stuff happening through other agencies. But I, I certainly feel like we need to sort of up the ante, uh, up the investment and up the sort of focus on delivering to that sector, given it's so important to our economy that I really um, think that we can do something pretty cool and innovate and, and you know, just do things differently and almost case manage or be a concierge for small business um, to navigate through government, to navigate through their life cycle of their business and just really put ourselves out there uh, and make it easy to do business with, which is one of my big themes. But not just for consumers, but for, for small business small as business. well. Great, thank you very much. Remember to submit your questions. We're getting close to answering some of your questions. Um, you've had a helicopter view. Um, Nick, you've been here four months. Uh, with the perspective you bring to your role as head of the public sector, what now do you think is our biggest challenge um, moving forward? Um, look, I think the... Uh, challenge for us starting at the sort of leadership level is we've sort of had a lot of really good conversations. Again, as I said, I've had uh, excellent support from the chief executive group around, um, you know, the strategy uh, around, um, you know, uh, talking about purpose, and we'll come to that in a minute, um, talking about the governance and the, how we're going to sort of look at our performance, and that's been excellent, right? It's really, really encouraging. But we're only at the starting point. And um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of uh, execution of the strategy to, to really, um, that's where the rubber hits the road. Right. So um, you know, I think you said culture eats strategy for breakfast <laughs> or something like that. Um, you know, execution can beat you know, eat strategy for breakfast as well. It's all no good having a strategy if you don't execute. Yep. Um, in fact, this is where some corporates actually fall down in execution. Um, and, and so um, it's not like as if corporates do this really well and, and the public sector doesn't. Corporates fail on this all the time. Um, and so to me, I think that challenge of saying, okay, right, we've got an idea of what we want to do um, and we've got the, some gut engagement from the leaders, how do we execute and execute through our teams mm. uh, around a common purpose? Mm. So we're going to talk a bit about that common purpose and I think, Nick, you'll talk about how we rally everyone in the public sector. Um, so Nick and I and the teams um, uh, across government have been working on um, really what we're calling reimagining the public sector. So at the back of COVID late last year, a few of you in the room were part of sessions that we had, we as in my office and sort of leaders across the sector about how do we reimagine the public sector? What do we do differently on the back of what has been the most disruptive time for anyone in any business, whether it was working from home, um, whether it was our response to COVID, and I think the state public sector here has got um, very high levels of client approval rating. One of, the, one of the first things that basically came to mind was we have people in the sector that, that basically are very purposeful, that they come here because they want to make a difference. And so I was sharing that with Nick, and uh, one of the things that Nick said, the first thing we need to do is actually work on that common um, purpose. And um, Nick, you might want to take over from here in terms of where we might, where we've landed. Yeah, with some I mean, of that well, work. well, firstly, hats off to um, to um, the chief executive group, but was sort of led by yourself, Irma, and David. Uh, this piece of work, and so it was already underway um, when I joined, and I was just so thrilled uh, to to see that because. Um, as the uh, 
chief executives will know, the very first day I, I, I put a draft <coughs> of some a strategic framework and at the top of it was a purpose um, and it was a, just a, one that I'd made up um, as a, what makes me sort of get a bit excited about working in the public sector and, and um, you know, we'd already got a piece of work underway so that was fantastic to, to see and, and obviously what we um, want to um, show you today is the work that uh, we've worked together as a team, uh, including a lot of feedback from um, our frontline staff uh, and the chief executives and a bunch of other folk across the public sector. Many agencies had involvement in this, so it's, it's great to culminate in, in, in letting you know a little bit about it, but it's, it's, it's really, for me, it's why we do what we do. And, and I think if we can sort of um, bottle this and, and create some real energy around it, I think we can really make some things happen and, uh, and really make a difference. So I, I think, um, for me, uh, it's the light on the hill. It's the thing that um, is the aspirational uh, sort of reason for doing what we do. And, uh, you know, there's a bit of science to it too because um, companies that, that or, or organisations um, like the public sector, uh, no matter where you are, with private or, or public sector, um, if you've got a, a, a common purpose and you're actually living to it, what, show, what history shows or research shows is, or performance shows is in terms of um, customers are happier, staff are more engaged, you perform better, uh, you're able to innovate more, you're about to, able to transform more easily. Um, and so for me, it's, it's sort of like a foundational layer. And, and, but I'm also realistic, right? We're, we're a very big uh, um, sort of organisation, very complex, got multiple agencies, um, all with slightly different constructs. And so, to me, it, it is though the common thing, but I also realise that there'll be some agencies where um, you know we have to sort of do a bit of work to make sure that it, it, it's 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 for them. And I, but we've done the research. Hopefully, it's something that hmm. will resonate. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm certainly excited by it. And I'm hmm. I'm going to roll the sleeves up and and make sure to the best that I can that we live up to hmm. it. Um, and and but it's something that comes from within. You know, it's not it, it's not a a slogan. Uh, it's not a gimmick. It's not a. It has to endure. It has to have life. And and you know, I, I know companies and corporates that have had purpose statements that f fade over time. Or you know, I'm sure we've had it in in the public sector where we've uh, collectively or individual agencies have had these sorts of things. So um, I, I'm, I'm I'm aware of the challenge here, yeah. but I but I also feel like um, it's leader led. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have to lead this, um, I have to lead this, and I'm prepared to do that, and, mm. and hopefully um, our public sector will mm. come along for the ride. So the key is what we do to engage going forward. Yep. Um, and it's not that we haven't, we've built on our previous purpose statement, so I, over to showing you what we've yeah, got. Yeah, so um, up next will uh, be just a, a video which uh, I think um, brings it all together and, and the important thing to, to note on, on this video is that all the words that come up, uh, all the themes that come up in the video are from you. They're from you or your uh, representatives, if you like, who had input into the research. So this isn't just a bunch of words that we sat, up, sat around a table and came up with, it actually came from the research. And obviously um, there's many themes and so you, a purpose statement can't be very long, it has to be quite short. So we had to try to bring it all and synth synthesise it down into one uh, tight okay. sentence and I think we'll uh, get into it and have a chat afterwards.
go. Um, yeah, give a bit of a round of applause. Um, the, uh, just a little thing, the, the lines um, signify sort of uh, coming together and, and working together. One of the big themes that came through in the research um, was working together. But we sort of ultimately thought, um, and, and the, the research was telling us as well, that, that working together is the how we do it, not the why we do it. Why we get out of bed in the morning is to make a difference so South Australia thrives. The how we go about doing that is working together. And you could use the lines as agencies working together, individuals working together, whatever you like. But it's the point is, is that that creative device of the lines coming together is just a symbol, if you like, for collaboration and, and working across, across agencies. Great. Mm. Um, I, I, for me, I think that a lot of people that work in the public sector, in particular when you look at the work that we do, confidence in the public sector has grown significantly since COVID. And I think that often we don't get really proud of what we do. So some of us are driven by that personal purpose. Um, and I think that for me, when I see that, it makes me feel really proud being part of the, the public service. So it certainly resonates um, with me. I'm, I mean, it's, it's um, um, and funny enough, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it's not the same, but it's not wildly different to what I thought, um, you know, uh, at, the, at the start of it, but it was, it was, um, it was really great to see the feedback. I mean, making a difference. I know it's perhaps been around in some agencies before as well, but I just encourage everyone to get behind it. Um, you know, it, I think it represents what we do. I, I think I'm really, um, uh, I guess, encouraged and I'm inspired by what I see happening around the place and the, the difference we can make. And the thing that I've learned in, in the first three or four months is just... Um, the impact that we can have in our roles on the state of South Australia, a state that I love and I'm sure many of you do as well, is, is, mm. is much greater than I can as the CEO of Bank SA. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Oh, now that you realise that, great. Yeah. Um, so the, the purpose, how uh, we're saying it's a foundational piece, I totally agree with you. So in light of that new purpose, um, how do we change? What, what do you think would be the the way we start to sort of progress and, and change and look forward? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's the challenge is how do we bring it to life? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that's um, really important. And, and, and as, a, as an example, I think we've got uh, a bit later, uh, which I think is a great example of how we can do that. But I, I would envisage us sort of going, all right, um, things like uh, creating uh, internal campaigns and promotions around... Um, you know, what we called hashtag making a difference and, and making sure that this, we're telling stories. I, I'm a massive believer in storytelling uh, and, and creating um, shining lights on great stories that come from all the different agencies out there. All the p imagery on the video is all from, from you essentially and, and, and I'm sure there's so many great stories out there that we can bring to life and, and, and reinforce that what, what mm. this is all about. Irma, I think um, yep. you know, it'd be very exciting to, to do that. Um, but it has to be leader-led as well. So one of, the, one of the actions really is about sort of making sure that we, um, we take it on and, 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 and reinforce it at every opportunity. In our discussions, we've talked not, uh, not only, because we do talk a lot about the what, what we do, but it's actually more about why we're doing it mm. and the impact it actually has. And I think all too often we keep doing the same thing, mm. but sometimes it doesn't have the impact. So we actually have to focus on the why. Yeah, as well. that's right. That's right. I think it's critical and... and um, um, you know, the, the, the why in, in the impact we can have um, in sort of really focusing on the, the customer experience at an at a even bigger level mm. than we're already doing, I think, you know, could be really mm. fascinating. I mean, I, I, I talk about them a bit and I'm not, I'm not saying that they've got it 100% right, but when I talk to my friends or colleagues in Sydney, they go, mm. geez, New South Wales government's the easy, to, yeah, easy yeah, to do business, business with. And, and I think that's the space that we'd love to be in a few years' time. All right. What's your personal purpose then, Nick? We all have one then. What yeah. drives you? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, I'm pretty uh, focused at the moment. Um, I think I'm driving my team a little bit batty, um, I have to say. Because I'm just <laughs> They're right, nodding yes, Nick. I'm right in the zone at the moment. <laughs> you know, there's a few people who know me in, um, in the room and have worked with me before. And I, I'm in that early zone where I just, you know, really, really focused um, and, and energetic and got lots of ideas and um, and so I mean I'm just sort of keen to, to try to mm. 
and I'm personally challenged. I, I, you know, I'm a little scared. You know, I don't mind saying of, of can I do this? You know, um, I think I can, but I'm, I doubt. I have doubts. Uh, I have fears. Um, mm. I'm not scared to show vulnerability. Um, but I also know I, I've had some experience and success in leading large teams, not as big as this, but but um, you know I, I'm I'm sort of you know want to have a crack Great. and uh, really yeah. see if we can make something happen. Yeah, well, it's right. See if Nick we can make a difference at scale. A know? lot of his kind of fears and you know the conversations we have is Nick will talk quite openly about some of the kind of concerns, test ideas, and the rest of it. So I've really appreciated that. So as a head of the public sector, you you do have a a focus on um, what your priorities are, and we've certainly talked about that at our Senior Management Council. Um, perhaps talk to us a little bit about your sort of strategic priorities at the moment. I think you wanted to share that Yes, with us. I think we've got a, a slide. Um, the side ones are a bit grainy, but the front ones work well, I think. So um, Talk us through that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess um, this is a, a framework um, that... Um, you know, we we've, we at the at the senior management council have been talking about for pretty much the whole time, um, and that's important because um, you know everyone's engaged in it, uh, and the you can see um, the purpose is at the very top, um, uh, making a difference so South Australia thrives. But you know we we we've done the work and literally only only put that little bit in in the last week or so, and um, but there's three three key priorities that that. I'm, uh, and, the, and the leadership team are, are really um, focusing on, and, and there's lots we can do, and, and, and you know, in, in some ways these are quite large ones. So the first one um, is the economy, and, and um, you know, the premier uh, and, and, and the whole cabinet and everyone really want to, to get our economy growing up towards three percent, and uh, so. Um, that's that's great, and, and the aspiration is, is quite um, high, uh, and uh, we actually will deliver three percent in the short term because we're coming off a, a low base. But this is about sustaining a sort of up towards three percent uh, economic growth for, for multiple years. Um, we've got the growth state strategy, which um, is well uh, entrained. Uh, so we're about a year or so into that, um, but there's a lot more work that we need to do because uh, the fundamental fact of growth state, it only delivers about one third of the economic growth that we need to achieve the, one, the three percent goal. Um, and you know, uh, I think there's so much more that we need to bring our arms around and work together as a, as a group on and, and, and things like the small business economy, things like population growth and, and, uh, and, 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 and the like. And so this is the sort of, um, uh, I guess, the culmination of a number of months work where these words or these uh, initiatives on here are the agreed set of strategic priorities with the uh, Senior Management Council, with ministers, um, and you know, this is really it. Um, mm. So it's, it's great to have it on one page, and this is the really important things. Now, this isn't saying this is all we're going to do, this is just saying that if we had to step back from it, what are the really important strategic uh, uh, priorities under the economy, uh, strategic priority, that's, that, that's those. Under the thriving South Australia one, that's a, a, our, our sort of uh, social agenda um, with COVID recovery and, and, and really important uh, conversations we're having about vulnerable families, which include domestic violence and child protection, um, health and wellbeing, mental health, um, homelessness and housing, all those sorts of things, keeping people safe, their Aboriginal uh, affairs, they're all in that space. And the, the final one is around the customer experience. and, and that's what we're calling easy to do business with. That could be for consumers, it could be for business. Um, it's a cultural uh, and, and um, a cu cultural program as much as anything, but it has physical elements. It could be around how we face the market. It has a heavy dose of digital being uh, how we can enable some great new um, propositions for customers. And uh, some examples there are, are just there for, for, you know, some of which are already underway and some of which we're yet to start. But we're also researching, uh, and some of you might be involved in this through agencies at the moment, um, both through what you know about your, your, your customer experience and the priorities, but then ultimately we're going to talk to a whole bunch of customers and get their feedback. Underpinning all this are, are core capabilities, which we have to think about at a holistic whole of government level. And so things like digitally enabled, data driven, well managed, well governed, customer centric, etc. 
are, are very, very important in that. Um, inspirational leadership, I think, needs to be there. And certainly uh, thinking about strategic communication and how we tell the story of what we're doing is really, really important. Uh, the Premier and I were in Sydney uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, uh, the, we had an event with, with CEOs and, and chair, chairmen and chairwomen of various organisations. And um, it was a very exciting uh, discussion. They were just really pumped about South Australia and how well things are going. And the editor of the Australian um, asked a question at the very end of the lunch and just said, well, what's, if there's one thing holding South Australia back, what, would, what is it? What, what would it be? And the answer was uh, from the people in the room was a little bit about, oh, I think we can tell the story a bit better. We can bring it together a little bit better as, as, a, um, as, a, as a, um, one sort of overarching story because there are lots of really good things going on. A lot of excellent initiatives through agencies and we do tell that story, you know, department by department or agency by agency, but is there a way we could step back and go, what's the story at, at the macro at the level? Whole, yep. um, that we're not just talking to sort of niche mm. uh, industries or um, groups of mm. people, but we're also um, being a bit more proud of what we do and, and yep. talking to the masses about that as well. Great. So that's, that's a challenge ahead of us, but that's, that's what I'd mean by strategic communication. Mm. There's other elements like we're the first to have a digital licence and we didn't tell anyone about it sort of thing. So, yep. so we, we need to do New South Wales say this is great mm. and well, we had it first. Um, so, you know, just that type of thing as well. Mm. And yeah, you've been very excited about that. Just to end the conversation before we go to some questions from the audience, to end the conversation about purpose, and it's the beginning of the conversation, but yeah. um, there's what we had the Premier's Excellence Awards um, recently, so there's a good way of us showcasing what I think is exceptional service at different levels and I think that's actually at the heart of what purpose is why people get driven to do certain things so what one thing would you ask anyone well I guess the people in the room or the people in the public service what's the one thing that you would ask a public a servants in response to the purpose and then we can show what it looks like through the awards yeah yeah well I guess um, just really encourage you to get on board um, uh, with the uh, the purpose work and, and to bring it to life. I, I have a feeling, you know, to me it's, it's, it's in your heart. It's, it, you don't have to sort of fake it till you make it. You actually either get it or believe it or you don't. Uh, hopefully you, you can get something out of that and you can bring it to life in, in whatever shape or form it, it works for you. But I, I, I think we've got a video here, and mm. some of you would have seen this, but I think there's no better way to describe what making a difference means than, than to see what it means for Mark from, from pathology. He's been involved in the COVID response. Late in 2019 and into early 2020, it became apparent the COVID-19 virus was beginning to circulate worldwide. There was no understanding at that time of how large scale that would be. Every country with 7 billion people trying to say, actually, we need to be able to test. The Americas and Europe, their populations far exceed ours and their demands are far higher. So we had to try and fit into that system and say, well, how can we manage this without competing directly with those guys? At the time, there was no globally available testing procedure for detection of this virus. In response to this challenge, we developed an assay that fitted with our testing procedures. At no time did the government come to us and say, you need to test X number of samples, and we said we couldn't do it. Everywhere else in the country had that issue. If we got this wrong, we could be USA. We could be, we had, you know, one point we had many positives per day. How do we turn around from that? So yeah, I'm very proud of our successes as a laboratory to manage the epidemic that we're seeing and are seeing. And I, I guess it's just continuing to try and keep progressing and, and, and moving forward and maintaining that service. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, you know, you can see the emotion in Mark there. Um, look, you know, that's that's what making a difference is all about to me. Um, and I'm, so I'd encourage you, and we, we, we're creating a, a website, and I think it's makingadifference.sa.org.au, is it? Yep. Um, so that will be a place to bring um, examples. Uh, or, you know, it could be just, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it yet, but it, it's going to be, you, know, you could publish your, your example and we can follow it up and get bring it to life. Um, maybe you could do videos and upload it, I'm not sure, but mm. we'll, we'll work on that um, part in, the, of the in the coming days and weeks. It's also, part of our process is also to develop a toolkit for yes. everyone to kind of understand how 
purpose kind of fits into your own sort of strategic planning, fits into your own vision and mission. You know, it's all those, those kind of um, key words, but it's actually how do you embrace uh, the process of people kind of engaging um, and becoming, really making it a culture where you're kind of fit together in that yeah. So we will have so, <coughs> more um, things for people to, to build on that. And hashtag making difference will probably be the sort of little code for, for, for sort of what we're talking about and, and just a short way to, to demonstrate that hashtag, you know, Irma's hashtag making a difference, right? And that's, you know, we can bring things to life in, in, in that way. Great. Look, what we'll do is go to a few questions that we've had from the audience and they've got, they're in front of me at the moment. Um, so you've talked a lot about uh, improving customer service, Nick. How would the public sector as a whole look different three years from now if we were doing this well? Um, that's a great question. Um, look, I think a few things. Um, first, probably, you know, we, we would have some measurement um, and, and track how we're, how we're going. Um, you know, I'd like to see us um, take on New South Wales as the leading jurisdiction on customer satisfaction. Um, that would be one uh, su uh, success factor. Um, but more importantly, I think it would be um, evident in everything that we do that, that we're sort of taking a customer lens, um, whether it be new propositions uh, or whether we're, we're, we're sort of um, looking at uh, uh, just any initiative where you're sort of going, well, what does that mean for the end customer? And, and, and basically, uh, one possible way is to not change the, 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 the way we operate and the way we have our structure, but the example of small business earlier is one where, and we did it recently with a, a regional work uh, website, I think it was, um, where we had multiple agencies working together on a proposition that actually was a bit more seamless for the, 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 the target audience as opposed to sort of this agency doing their bit and this agency doing their bit. So, um, you know, I, I think it will see a lot more collaborative, collaborative effort between agencies, but when we come to the market, it actually might look like you don't even know who it's from because it's coming from a customer, customer. in perspective, not mm. um, sort of government out, if that makes mm. sense. But there, that'd be two symbols mm. of, of success for me. Great. So what was your first best quick win that you're able to realise from transferring um, experience from the financial sector to the public sector? Oh, I don't know if I really um, thought of it that way. As, as I talked about earlier, um, I'm, I'm not really um, tackling it any differently. Um, um, you know, to be frank with you, I'm, 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 f I'm a believer in a repeatable formula of, of what we're trying to do. Um, there's no financial services, you know, um, easy answer to, to, to anything. Um, the only thing is, and, you know, my job is a leadership role, you know, I, I'm, I don't see necessarily um, anything uh, around that, but, 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 you know, if there is a quick win, it's about um, starting very early engaging people um, and, and demonstrate um, some, some real willingness to listen and, and collaborate and, and be very genuine and, and have a sense of purpose yourself. And, and mm. most of the time, I've found people want to come along mm. for the ride. Well, your quick win is we have a purpose statement and you've got your yeah, strategic I'll, I'll have, alignment. I have well, to say... There's, um, there's that in four months, so... As I've said to a, a number of people, it's probably a little bit ahead of where I expected to be, but that's great. Mm. That's great. That means we're, um, we're well set for uh, the future. Oh, good. Great. Um, this question a few people have asked. What's your advice to up-and-coming leaders in the public sector? Um, uh, and what were your expectations, good or bad, coming into the role? I mean, did you have any preconceived ideas? Have any of those kind of fears or whatever materialised? Um, yeah. <laughs> or you can't um, say? <laughs> no, look, uh, look, firstly, um, you should be very proud of what you do. Um, I think, um, you know, mm. it, it is ge genuine that, that I feel like uh, all of us, uh, no matter what role you're in, can have impact. Um, and... Um, that is, you know, that is really cool. That is really mm. cool, and and not many people, necessarily in the private sector, can say that, you know, uh, genuinely. I mean, that some people can, of course. Um, mm. uh, if you're a brain surgeon or something, you can have an well, they're, they're public servants. Too, um, so. But uh, <laughs> but um, but you know, generally we play a role in, in making some stuff happen, and I think that's fantastic. Great. Look, the perception. Um, you know, there is a couple of things, um, and, I, and I think we have to work on this. Um, and, um, you know, 
the, the pace um, that I'm used to working at is, is a little bit different. Um, very, very much um, used to working with strong outcome focus. Mm. Like, what are we actually looking to get out of this? And measuring that and tracking it and then going back and reviewing it and then holding people accountable if it's mm. not working. That's very much what I'm used to and I think there's a few elements there that we need to have a look at. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I just think there's so many good people Great. working very hard um, to, to do what they do, which is really impressive. And I think yep. we need to be a bit more proud of that. And I think we need to find a way, subject, you know, a little bit like I was saying earlier, to communicate that, not in an arrogant way, um, but in a genuine yep. way um, that maybe um, breaks down some of those perceptions a little bit um, over time. Well, the last two questions. Um, it, what's the greatest strength of the public sector? You mentioned that it's, um, you know, it, it's a bit different to the banking, but we are a complex beast, um, and measuring some of the things that we do uh, isn't quite as easy as that. So, what do you think is the, you know, one thing that you'd say, gee, they're great? I think at probably that. scale. You know, like if you think about how many people we have, and as a proportion of the, um, you know, people in South Australia, it's quite large, right? So it is. It's it's huge. So the power of 106,000 people working on mm. some key things is pretty scary good, you know, scary mm. in a good way. Um, <laughs> it, it, what, could we, what could we deliver if we get really focused and, yep. you know, like I take the economic one, for example, I'm getting quite excited about where that could go and, and how we could work together on on some some things that, you know, when and, and it's not to say um, some things aren't already happening, but it's the power of when people come together and say, well, that's a great idea, but what if we did this, and then how do we help you do that, and, and, and mm. get sort of multi-agency mm. teams working around population growth, or small business, or, or the, you know, the modern manufacturing, which is already happening, you know, with Leone and Adam and others. Um, that's pretty exciting, mm. and, and, I, and I think um, in the social space, we're having some really, we had a really good conversation a few weeks back around vulnerable families. I'm really excited whether we could make some dents on homelessness and things like that. You know, and again, it's going to take us all working together to make yep. it happen. And, and, and it, I'm not sitting here saying we aren't doing good things, but I, I genuinely believe we've got a notch up in in the way that we tackle it. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and and the last one, obviously, I'm super excited about. If it's one thing I want to leave a legacy on, it's the last one around the customer experience. And, and but it's an enormous agenda. Um, mm. It could take years and years. Oh, we're um, here to help you. And, uh, it's good. But, you know, yep. it, it, it's yep. great to yep. see. And I've had genuine first-hand experience when you improve processes for staff and for customers. The feedback you get, the kick out of that you get is pretty cool. Mm. Final question, Nick. Why did you leave the banking sector to come to public sector? Hashtag making a difference. Exactly. I mean, it is, it's corny, <laughs> but um, well, it's you, pretty corny. Well, I remember corny. you saying that. But, you know, like, it's, it's um, you know, it was a big change for me in many ways. Um, but... I felt like I wanted to um, to, to, to generally give back and, and make a difference. Um, it, that sort of whole thing resonates a lot for me and, and that's why I'm springing out of bed early in the morning and uh, mm. so driven at the moment to try and try and have some impact and but also have it endure over time rather okay. than sort of run out of steam after a few months. And, uh, Great. I see Rick in the car park early in the morning. He goes, "Oh, you still going?" And it's, that's uh, it's the a, reason why I don't uh, park in the car. Park. Uh, but you know, like I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm literally springing out of bed in the morning, sort of excited to sort of get stuck into it, and uh, yeah. and that's um, that's great. And that's been genuinely my experience with you, Nick. So thank you so much for your enthusiasm, um, and I guess the collaboration. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful four months, um, and the fact that we could actually come to this point with the purpose statement and collectively work together on building what's next for the public sector. It is a very exciting time. So please join me in thanking Nick Reid. Thank you. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I don't acknowledge IPA's major partners, State Government of South Australia, our senior management council that are here, PwC, Flinders University, Australia Post, Deloitte, this list is growing, and Sullivan Consulting. We also acknowledge IPA SA's professional members and councillors. Um, we have some future activities coming up, including the uh, inaugural, every year we have the IPA SA and PwC uh, annual economic outlook breakfast, the last one for the Treasurer, I would say, is that right? Yes. Um, on 2nd of July, where you will hear from the Treasurer, Rob Lucas, um, in his final year of tenure. 
So please, join me in thanking Nick, um, and I look forward to working with you all on uh, the journey that we've started today. Thank Thanks, you, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.